God's Word says right here, Exodus 34, 10, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which art thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I'll do with thee. What does the Azusa Street Revival and the Pensacola Revival so many decades later have in common? We're going to explore that today on Revival Radio TV. Stay tuned. Revival fires then and now. So glad you joined me today. I'm Dr. Gene Bailey. Thank you for joining us as we explore revivals. Today we're going to pick up. We left off last week talking about what happened when my guest Bill Holtzinger uh, came to the Repensacola Revival in his church, things that happened. So let me catch you up real quick. They come to the church, Father's Day, 1995. Bill shared with his with us his experience of coming into that coming into that revival, seeing God moving. He knew something was up, was a little skeptical, but yet that quickly went away when he had an experience with God. So Bill, that was a few nights in. That was on a Wednesday night. It was. And uh, the, the, the revival broke out Sunday night, 19, June 18th, I believe, 1995. So now you've had this experience with God. You've been laid out your face has been, you've been doing some carpet time <laughs> on your face in front of God and, and knew that this was a real, you're no longer skeptical. All that skepticism went away. What happened next? What did you do? Well, the next thing was we were trying to manage our time and because I had a company personally. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was telling me about, um, He wanted me in the revival 24-7. And so, we consequently ended up closing the business and I walked away from a very large contract that we had in the commercial cabinet business. Now did you ever, I mean that's what you just said was a huge thing because you've got a family, you've got bills to pay every month and, and you're, clo you're walking away from your business right? and you're going to be in the, in the revival like you said 24-7. Was that, was that an easy decision? Was it something you had to think long and hard about or was it just you knew that was what you had to do. Well, here's the interesting thing when the, when, when the Spirit of God shows up. A lot of things um, that matter doesn't matter. Right. Um, so, the, so to be in the revival and be under the presence of God after that first touch, that's all I could think about was being in, in His presence, just being in His presence, because this was really miraculous. And so <clears throat> it was a hard decision. And um, he was dealing with me about closing that company down. But because your business, you were doing quite well at the time. I was, and I just, I had just landed a really large contract. We, we were fairly new into the, into the commercial cabinet millwork business, uh, branching off into the commercial. And I had Pensacola NAS, they had a CNET job out there. And uh, they were converting their tarmacs and runways into dormitories and schools mm. and that kind right. of thing. And we had landed a really $350,000 job. Uh, and it, it was really going to, I was going to be a millionaire before I was 30. That was my worldly mindset and, and I was on track to make it and that was going to, that was going to push us really close to that. And, and so I'm trying to juggle right. the school. Consequently, we, t we ended up taking our son out of public school and we started homeschooling. And that was one of the best decisions that we ever did and never came out of that. And now, did you do that because of the revival, just the need to be in the revivals like you Because were? the need to be in the revival, yeah. yeah. And there's no way that we could go, you know, at that time after, after a few days, we were getting out of the church at 4 and 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. Mm. We were driving home and the sun's coming up. Well, I can't put my son on a school bus right. and send him to school. And how am I going to run a company when I got employees? I mean, we, I just wasn't having no sleep. And I was still trying to facilitate that somehow. And I was on the phone in my office and I was on a phone with a, an equipment manufacturer in Germany. 
and I was going to be ordering some equipment for this job. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, if you keep on with this, you're going to get hurt financially. And I just hung the phone up. I called the contractor and I said, I can't do the job. Mm. And he's like, what? This is a gravy job. Everybody, I said, I know. I said, no, I can't really explain it to you what, how or why, but uh, I can't, you won't understand it, but come to revival. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, so I gave the job back. And so um, <clears throat> we walked away from that and we were in revival from that point uh, every night. Mm. I want you to tell us, because there's, there's somewhere I'm going with this. Okay. Um, and the reason I'm asking this, because we were recently, you spoke here at Eagle Mountain Church, and uh, you talked about some of the manifestations. Now, what you're about to hear, didn't, this is the only time, this isn't the only time what he's about to tell you happened. If you go back to Wales revival, there were some phenomenal things that happened in the Welsh revival, and even in Azusa, manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the room. Tell us, what, what did you see, hear, experience? I, I would be back in the studio and later on during that time, uh, we started seeing things and they would report to us because we, we couldn't necessarily see it in the studio. You couldn't see it on camera. Mm. But if you go out into the sanctuary, you could see it. And there, was, there were several times when the, when the sanctuary was full of smoke. Mm. And sometimes it was a different color. And, uh, and Interesting. I, I don't know how the smoke came about, but it, it, and I can't explain it today. Right. There were other times where there were feathers. The feathers were falling. My wife brought two or three of them back to the studio and showed them. She had them in her hand. Mm. And nobody, nobody knows where the feathers come from. People would have gold dust on their, on their hands and, and heads. And so there was gold dust somehow or another attributed to that. You know, one of the, one of the neat things is the fire department was called on two different occasions that I, I remember. <clears throat> and they showed up and said that uh, the passerbys, that there, there's a road out uh, in front of the church, and so the, the traffic would be going back and forth. They had stopped and called, and the neighbors that could see the, the rooftop of the church had, had called and said the, roo the roof of the church was on fire, and, and the church was on fire. Hmm. And the fire department shows up, and of course there's no fire. I mean, there is a fire, but not that fire. But it's not a physical fire. And um, two different occasions they show up because of reports of the church being on fire. And you know, that's, that's, I'm glad you brought those up because those are the things I wanted to bring up. Now, if you go mm -hmm. back in some of our previous programs, we talk about, they called it at Azusa Street, the Shekinah glory yeah. that would just permeate that and come in. Even the, uh, uh, the, the dust, the, the feathers falling down, this was... Now, I don't know why these things happen. We don't have explanation for it. And, and don't be looking for, this, for the signs necessarily, but yet they are signs of God's presence in there. And in fact, the whole, what you just described about the church being on fire is almost <clears throat> exactly what happened at 312 Azusa Street right. with the fire trucks being called out because the church was on fire. And seeing the, the, the beam of light, they said, at the top of Azusa Street at the Apostolic Faith Mission there, that there was fire going up of the building and fire coming down. Yeah. And, you know, there was a hovering over the building. And it could be seen for miles around. Yeah. So there was constantly, and, and that what you just described at Pensacola so many years later is exactly what we heard happen back well, the, then. The beam of light is inter interesting from Azusa too because, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, we were going live over the radio and... Um, Daystar had come and we were doing some live stuff and we were trying to get it out as, as much as we could in the media that was available at that time. And we were going out live already. Well, there was a trucker coming down Interstate 10 and he had tuned in somehow or another and he got the broadcast that was going out live from, uh, from the church. And he doesn't know how he got to the church, but mm, he knows wow. he was driving and then all he knows is he was pointing towards the direction of the light beam coming out of this somewhere. And the only thing that I can attribute it to is the car lots when they have those really, really strong right. light beams. You can, see, you can see them, you know, driving around. It was probably brighter than that. I never saw it, but a lot of people did. And they would come to where this beam of light was shooting out of, out of the center of the church. Uh, consequently, he came in, gave his life to the Lord, got saved. 
And uh, we, had, we had many people that would show up to the revival uh, and they didn't know how they got there. Right. That this, it's like their car drove. Right. And, and they didn't know why they were there and now all of a sudden we're here. Okay, what is this? Well, let me go in and check it out and see why I'm here. And they come in and, and of course, hear Steve's message and, and get born again. You know, there's, you were telling a story, and I believe it was you, talking about how people would just show up and this wasn't, the church itself wasn't in the most affluent side of town, correct? Right, right. So you had all kinds of people walking in. What happened? Well, here's, here's the importance of revival. It's, it's because, you know, <clears throat> unity is so important. Unity right. is, is, is probably one of the biggest keys. You got to stay out of strife. Uh, for the Holy Spirit to move. So the unity, and what I mean by that is the body. They have a purpose. It's not just the leaders. It's the leaders and the body. And it's everybody working together, you know, spokes and a wheel. And so the, the purpose of the body is to facilitate what their jobs are. And they, and they became many because when revival comes, everything ramps up. Everything triples. And so workers are needed and servants are needed. And so the interesting thing about that is we had prostitutes that would walk off the street dressed like prostitutes mm. and coming into, you know, an Assemblies of God church that was, um, you know, a nice church and it was a conservative church at the time, you know, before revival. And these people would get up. These, these people that had been in this church forever probably helped pay for that pew that they were sitting on. Right. That was my pew. You know, you can find me any, <laughs> any Sunday. That's my pew. That's where I sit. Nobody sit there. And the hospitality they would get up and say, darling, you come sit in my seat. Right. And these prostitutes would walk in and, and they would get born again and saved. Wow. Praise God. What a, and, and I think, you know, if you've picked up, there's a recurring theme in what Bill has been sharing the last couple of broadcasts that we've been talking about, this revival in Pensacola. And that's the unity that was in the church itself, right. but also the church leaders. They right. were all for going in one place. And, and you know, it sounds like, well, of course you'd let them in. And, and you'd think, well, of course you let them take your seats. But it's different in a church when suddenly these people don't fit your little mold of what good little Christian people ought to be. Exactly. And they're not, maybe they don't smell right or look right or dress like you were just explaining accordingly, but yet they're there and they're under the presence of God. The, 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 the drunkards that would come in, drunk, smelling, and they would, they would sober, and they would get born again. Praise it's, God. You know, it, it was a salvation revival, but also it was a, a call to holiness mm. revival. And so, you know, the message was over and over again, and it's about God's people getting right with Him and holiness coming into, uh, to His people. It was like a Saul of Tarsus experience with Amy. And so the first night I went, I don't remember any of the preaching, any of the altar call. I mean, I don't even know if he gave an altar call. But um, at the end of the service, Allison was like, come up to the altar with me. And I was like, I don't want to go to the altar. I'm just going to sit here until y'all are ready to go, and then we'll go home. And so I sat there for like probably an hour or so, a long time. Allison kept coming back. She'd go up to the altar, and then she'd come back and say, please come with me. And I was like, I don't want to go. And whenever she came back and said, please go with me, I don't want to stand up there by myself. I felt sorry for her because I always kind of felt sorry for her. She was real timid and shy, and I was more, okay, I'll go with you. You know, I don't want you to stand by yourself. So I went up there. So I stood up there for two and a half hours. I was very stubborn. <laughs> going to have my way. And um, I waited for him. He kept passing by me, and he'd, like, pray for everybody around me, and then he'd look at me and smile and just keep right on going. And I was like, this guy's got an attitude. I mean, because I had an attitude, and I thought everybody else had an attitude. And I thought, he doesn't want to pray for me. I must look like somebody he doesn't like or something, you know. That was the only reason why I could figure out he wouldn't pray for me. So I was like, well, fine, I'll just stand here, and he's going to pray for me because if I'm the last person standing here and he doesn't pray for me, he's going to look bad, you know. And finally, it must have been around 11 o'clock at night, I don't remember the time that Steve came back by. One of those times he had gone back and forth and he just barely said more Lord to her and she was thrown to the floor and was on the floor for three to four hours and so many things happened when she was on that floor. God was just physically and literally with, if you've ever seen God with someone, he was with her on that floor.
But then when I saw her on that floor that day, it was just like, my gosh, this has to be God because I just saw this girl and uh, I know how she is. And to see her on the floor with the power of God sweeping through her life. And uh, it was just so neat to see her when she got up off the ground. She didn't have a clue what happened. And I was in awe. Matter of fact, I was there to like 5 or 5.30 in the morning. We saw the sun come up that morning. I was just in, I was in such awe of what God was doing in her life. It was a holy, hallowed moment. They said it looked like somebody hooked me up to a, an electric you know, plug because they said from my head to my feet would shake and it was like I was almost I was almost off the ground it would shake so hard but it didn't hurt and I I I can't say that I've ever really understood it but all I knew was that inside I was changed and inside as all that was going on God was healing me inside when Elizabeth came home shaking from the revival I wasn't scared there was nothing scary about it. I knew that it was God. I knew that what God was doing in her, I mean, I had seen her drunk. I had seen her pass out from alcohol. And I thought, she was looking for such a rush from alcohol. She was looking for such a rush from these parties and this music and, and this drug that she would put in her body. And that would make her pass out. That would make her fall down on the floor and just act like a fool and not even know who was going to bring her home, not even know how she was going to get home. I thought, just because she's shaking, if it's God, you know, she's been looking for something like this. That was the counterfeit. This is the real. And you just can't tell me that it wasn't God. I, I am a mother. I had three daughters. I've seen them go through hell. And I've seen God. I've seen Him move upon their bodies. I've seen Him change their hearts. I've seen Him rebirth their spirits and renew their minds. And I've, I've just seen Him. I haven't seen His body or His face, but I have literally seen Him present with them. And I never saw a manifestation before that night, and I've never had a doubt that it was God. Never. I've never looked back, never turned back thinking that, well, maybe this isn't God. Maybe this is, you know, something weird. No. It's God. All I knew was that for the first time in my life, I felt, I felt life. And it wasn't something that I had to go drink to get. It wasn't a fulfillment that I had to get from alcohol or from boyfriends or from friends at school or from accomplishing things. It was something that was there. It wasn't, it was something that was more real than anything I had ever known. It was more real than my own body. It was, and at that point my whole life was changed because I thought, this is what I want. This feeling inside of me is what I want. And what it was, it was the love of God. It wasn't some preacher staring down my throat saying, you know, quit sinning, quit drinking, sit in church and be boring. It was the love of God. It was the life of God that entered my spirit. And I've never been the same. And in history, we see that with every revival, that's, that was almost a byproduct. While they may have come to see what was going on, I'm thinking of um, Evan Roberts and the Welsh revival and how the, the cities were shutting down. They had an election, and the election stopped because everybody came to the revival. And, Suddenly the bars are closing because everybody's coming to the revival and people are getting saved. But yet the second, the next thing that happened is they didn't want to go back to the bars and the pubs and everything. Now they want to be in the, right. they want to be in the presence of God. And what was once okay, I just didn't want to do it. It wasn't like, well, I've got to be a good Christian now. They didn't have any desire to do that. It's just like you were explaining about your skepticism. While you were skeptic one minute, the next minute, that's not even on the plate right. because you had an experience with God. So tell me something else. What else happened? Well, the people that was coming in, the miraculous um, ways that they would get there, we, we had, um, I remember we had a couple of Playboy bunnies that came in mm. and they were in town for a photo shoot. And uh, they, they got in, they had some time. So something happened. I don't remember this story all that well, but I just remember uh, we're talking about it. and. They got in a taxi and said, and they told the taxi driver, hey, take us to the most happening place in the town. So he brought them to Brownsville. 
<laughs> the church. <laughs> And they got out. They said, what is this? They said, you said the, the, the most the happening, happening place, place in this town. This is it. That's the way church ought to be, the most happening place in town. And they came in and got born again and gave their life <laughs> over to the Lord. You know, the, um, you can go back, it's on tape, it's on film. The sheriff at the time, they couldn't put, they didn't have uh, um, exact numbers, but their responses and the calls that went out in that community after revival broke out, dropped dramatically. Mm. So the crime started to go away. I think the Brownsbury Re revival has had a positive effect, certainly on the environment of that neighborhood. The crime, uh, we did not experience a lot of uh, felony crime in that area. The misdemeanor crime, such as prostitution, uh, and with that, of course, comes some drugs, which is felony. That has disappeared from the immediate vicinity of the church. Perhaps millions of people now worldwide know of Pensacola, e even though they haven't been here. Uh, and so from a purely economic development perspective, uh, from a mayor's perspective, uh, from a chamber of commerce perspective, uh, it has been a very positive uh, occurrence in our community. Uh, it has brought Pensacola, the Pensacola community, to the attention of uh, millions of people on, uh, across the, the world. And so people were, were getting in. They were getting saved, and they were telling their friends and, and their family members. And they were bringing the lost and family members. This is why the body is so important, because when, when you experience the power of God in your life, and we all have family, right? and, and you, I, brought my, I brought some of my family members there. You know, I, this is, this, is my, this is my saying, you know, the Holy Spirit can do in 10 seconds what I can't do in 10 years. Right. And so I can talk to my family. I can talk to my coworkers. I can talk to my employees. I can talk to, I just bring them there. Mm. And, and they got the ex, uh, same experience that I did, and the Holy Spirit did it. He gets the credit for it, right, and their right. lives are changed forever. What was, tell me what you felt like is the most important thing you gleaned from that time. You were there for almost the entire revival of what went on there. Um, so, what do you think? What do you think you really got from that whole time there? Obviously, we've got wonderful stories, and and God showed you some great things. But when you think back, what do you think God's reasoning was to have you there, or do you even know? That's a good question. Um, I think the Lord was preparing me for things that. <clears throat> I'm walking in now. Right. Um, you know, he, he called me to the audio. Uh, I didn't know why. And I had never mixed on a sound board or I didn't, there's hundreds and thousands of knobs. I didn't know what none of them did. And so as we began to move in that and um, he, he began to call me to the studio and specifically for the, the videotapes to make the sound he told me, I want these tapes to sound as good as possible, as good as they can be. And I didn't know anything about recording. I didn't know anything about that. But there was some reason he was sending these tapes. Well, I had no idea. And they had a studio. There was nobody running it. They were just taking a house fee, uh, mix off the, right. off the, a mix off the house board. And, and so I got in there and, and started to uh, learn how to do this audio. And I'd, I'd take these tapes home night after night. I'd get a tape out take it home, see how it s sounded on the TV, and then I, I learned how to tweak things to make it sound the best it could possibly sound. Little did I know that those tapes would go all over the world. Salvations were recorded mm -hmm. because family members that went there and experienced revival would get a tape and send to a loved one in another state, another country, and they would watch it and get born again. So they were very important, but God knew. Right. I didn't know, but here's, here's, our, here's our job. Just, just say, yes, Lord. I, I'm a willing vessel, and use me how you want to use me. And sometimes the sacrifice of what we're doing at the time has to be made for the betterment of what God's doing and wants you to do. And He's not doing it so that you will lose something. He's doing it so you'll gain something. Now, I'm going to tell you, you know, three and a half years later, as things were, um, revival is, is, is going, it's strong, we've got the lines going across the street and down the road. I mean, people would line up four or five o'clock in the morning. They would stand in line all day long 
Right. All right. year long, winter, summer, spring, fall, didn't matter if it was raining or a hurricane was coming, they were in line. And so all that was still happening. And about three, three and a half years into that, I left a company, let's say, uh, you know, I had a three four $400,000 job and we had a commercial business. But three and a half years into that, when things kind of smoothed out and, and, and we had a little bit more control, in other words, I knew what I was doing. Right. It didn't take quite as much time during my day. It took my nights. And we were going to, you know, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, which is doable for me to go do something else during the day. God literally, literally handed me another company hmm. that was 10 times bigger than the one I gave up. Wow. I, he literally handed me a multi-million dollar company with no money out of my pocket. Wow. And so it was like him saying, yeah, you, you gave this up for me so you could facilitate what I needed done. And now that this is running the way I want it, I'm going to give this to you better than what you had. Praise God. You can't outgive God, can you? You cannot outgive God. Yeah. Bill, before we go again, I'm going to ask you to pray again for the people watching. And you know, you did this at church for that impartation. So I'll ask you to do that again in just this last minute and a half. So just look to the camera and pray for the folks at home. Okay. Father, I just praise God for all the people watching here, the telecast that's going out. Lord, I just ask in the name of Jesus that you touch each and every person and give them a fresh anointing. Lord, I ask you to fill them with your Holy Spirit, not halfway, but all the way. There's more than enough anointing to go around. And this is, when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, it changes, it changes lives. And Lord, I just receive with them and for them the fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit in their lives that they may get a manifestation of a, the power of God and the presence of God in their life, not only for them, but for their loved ones and the people that they use. And Lord, that you would use them mightily for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for sharing with us. You know, we're going to, if you want to know more about Bill and his ministry, all you need to do is go to his website, Bill. WholesingerMinistries.org. It's the address there on your screen. You can find out more about them. And I want to encourage you to follow us on Facebook and go to our website, RevivalRadioTV.com, and you can find out more about what's happening. Listen, we are launching new things all the time. Be a part of our Revival Radio TV team. Just follow the link there, sign up, and you'll get extra videos and extra behind the scenes footage and stuff that you don't get just from watching the program and be part of our team as we build the team that helps bring revival to this next generation. Well, I want to see you again here next week at the same time. Don't forget Jesus loves you and Bill and I love you and Jesus is Lord. Revival Radio TV, there's so much that we cover here on this program. There's no way for us to cover it all in a half hour. That's why I want you to go to our website RevivalRadioTV.com. There you're going to see several things that take you more in detail. You want links to stuff, links to videos, links to articles. That's where you can find it. Go to our website and see what's there about revivals and how you can be the one.